All right, we'll go ahead and kick things off. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Julie Gatt. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Super Apps and Super, Super Chaos. Uh, we have two experts here today, Instabug's product managers, Frida and Iran, who will walk us through today's presentation. Uh, just a few housekeeping reminders. Um, everyone will be on mute um, for the webinar, and we're going to save all the questions for the end. And a recording um, of this webinar will be sent out at the conclusion of today's webinar. Um, and with that, um, I'd like to introduce our presenters today, Frida and Ron. Hi, everyone. I'm Farida. Hello, and this is Naran. Um, and yeah, basically today we're going to talk to you about um, super apps. So basically, just to, to go over the agenda, we're going to talk about super apps, uh, the different opportunities and challenges that you can face while building a super app. And um, before we start, we can start with like an imaginary scenario where let's say you want to um, book the new Batman movie, go see it with some friends. Uh, and afterwards, you want to go um, have some dinner, you, you want to make a reservation. Uh, you want to take some ride or book a ride over there. And then after the day is done, you want to pay your friend back. So usually when this happens, you would need to navigate between four to five different uh, uh, applications in order to do all this kind of everyday uh, things. But what if you can do all of this through one single super app? Uh, so there's no particular or set definition for what the super app is, but it's essentially a mobile app that covers, uh, um, that offers an ecosystem of services that are shaped around um, the user's everyday uh, needs. So those needs are things that we do on an everyday basis, like online payments, uh, ride ordering, chats, social media, food delivery, and uh, online shop. And now we're going to talk about the rise of super apps. Okay, thank you, Farida. So as Farida mentioned, now we'll go through the, the rise of the app, of the super apps, the concept, how it evolved in the different markets. So as Farida mentioned earlier that there are a lot of definitions currently when it comes to defining what is a super app and what are the aspects of the super app. However, the concept of the super app, this is something that is not uh, really new. It was actually first introduced in 2010 uh, by the BlackBerry founder. He predicted that we'll have a super apps and the super apps would be something like an ecosystem that, that provides a seamless and integrated experience that covered different aspects. So um, along with the other definitions that we currently have uh, for the super app, but it all evolves around the same concept. Uh, so now we're going to share with you um, the journey of the first actual super app that evolved, which is actually the WeChat. Uh, WeChat was first introduced in 2011. It was introduced in China. It, this is a, a Chinese company. It was uh, introduced first in the market as a, a messaging platform, and it was just a reaction as uh, a reaction for the um, for the Chinese uh, government uh, decisions to uh, close all the communication and messaging app. So this was the main purpose and why it was introduced in the, to the Chinese market at this point of time. However, by introducing the WeChat app, the app started to evolve and the growth rate was uh, very steady. And by the year 2013, they started to introduce different uh, services, uh, which is mainly the payment services. And by the year 2013, uh, the number of monthly active users, it hit 100 million uh, users at this point of time. After this year, uh, WeChat started to evolve and they started to introduce more or more services that helps the user to be to automate their daily life and to be used as day-to-day uh, -day, um, apps uh, covering different aspects. So as you can see in this screenshot, this, this represents the ecosystem that is currently provided by the WeChat. They expanded the value proposition and they expanded the offering that they give to the market covering different aspects, starting with the online payments, uh, with the shopping options, with the gaming and other different aspects. Besides, they also, they also introduced different partnerships through introducing the concept of the mini apps that we're going to tackle later in the, in the presentation today. But basically through these partnerships, they introduced different uh, services and different functionalities through the platform or through WeChat. And by this transition, by moving to a super app, actually the, start, the, 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 the company started to evolve again. And by the year 2016, it hits the, uh, it hits the almost 900 million active uh, monthly uh, users. 
And uh, as of now, in Jan 2022, uh, the number of monthly active users in WeChat is 1.2 billion users. So actually, uh, the WeChat, it was not only in the Chinese market, it expanded to other markets uh, in USA and other markets. So, and the and, um, popularity of the application is currently uh, one of the top popular apps. So as you can see in the charts, it's currently number five most popular app worldwide, not only in uh, Asia or in China. So looking at the numbers of WeChat as of now, they are having 1.2 billion monthly active users. Uh, out of these users, there are 1.48 million uh, active users that are based in US. And they are using around 445 billion messages daily. And they have around 82 minutes that are being spent by each user on a daily basis. So this is this number shows um, the growth rate and the steadiness in the growth. Besides, it shows the scale of the data that, that is captured and handled uh, by the WeChat application. So WeChat was actually the first uh, known super app uh, that was uh, rose, uh, that was in uh, China or in the East in general. However, there are many other apps in, uh, in the East currently. One of them is Grab. Uh, Grab followed similar approach or similar journey. It started as online taxi booking service fo focusing only on the service, but looking at the timeline by, the, by time by time or year by year, they started to expand their services, introducing also financial services and wallet systems and, and, and uh, payment systems. In addition to other services, besides they started to um, to explore or to expand across different countries as well, um, yeah, until they became a super app. So these are just two examples. However, if we if we uh, dig deeper into into the East um, culture or into sorry the East uh, scene, you can find a lot of other super apps. And one of the reasons or main reasons why super apps, they, they shine or they started more in Asia, there are actually several reasons. The first was the start of, um, as I mentioned, that it was just a reaction of not having the other uh, well-known uh, communication applications. However, now it's more of a lifestyle. Uh, most of the of the East Kong countries, they don't have very strong internet connectivity at this point of time, so they wanted to make sure that they are very cautious when it comes to the resources, so super apps help them to maintain or to regulate the usage of the internet uh, using apps with the single app instead of using multiple applications, which is also reduce the storage uh, or minimize the storage that they need to, to have on their apps. Besides one very important aspect is the adoption of the online banking. This was not very popular, especially before COVID in the East um, countries. However, with the introduction of the super apps and the wallet systems and the online payments, this helped a lot in the adoption of the online banking and the payment systems. Um, so these are so just uh, some numbers about uh, Grab, how uh, it is performing currently. So Grab is one of the top uh, Asian uh, um, apps when it comes to the delivery and the digital payments. Uh, the growth rate actually it is uh, performing very well, around 70% in 2020, and they are they have around 214 uh, app downloads, million app da downloads. Besides, they offer the variety of services as mentioned before. So uh, we talked about the, the scene in Asia and how this is appealing when it comes to the different apps that started with whether um, uh, messaging or delivery or a specific business domain and they expanded to be a super app. In addition to the other model, which is the fintech um, apps that also expanded to be a super app like uh, Alipay, for example. However, there's still some question marks about how the, how, what is the scene in the, in the West. And how, and how the adoption or the introduction of the super apps will look like in the West. So as of now, we don't have like a super app that is following the exact definition of the super app. However, we have a lot of big brands and big names uh, in West that they are actually considering and they started to get more attracted to the concept of the, use of the super apps. Uh, before the direction of the West or the, or the trend of the West was mainly focusing on specific use case or specific business domain and have a, a focus on this and to uh, tackle the uh, double down on this uh, business domain and to, to increase it. So, for example, even Uber, they started uh, as um, uh, their, the services that they're providing, whatever they're expanding, the areas that they're expanding in. 
uh, they were still focusing on the delivery and uh, making people uh, delivering them from point A to point B. However, with the rise of the concept of the super app, there is a big attention from these big names and from the West uh, companies as well. And there was uh, some uh, announcements, especially from Uber, for example, they explicitly announced that they are planning to be an upcoming super app. And they started to launch different features or different um, domains, like, for example, you Uber Explore that helps uh, exploring the different uh, restaurants or the different uh, attracting um, areas around. Uh, besides also Facebook, the, the, uh, the, with the launch of the bots in India that enabled the online payments, this also um, raises um, a highlight that this might be the next step even for the, for the, for the big names and the big brands like, the Uber, like Uber, Airbnb, Facebook, and other uh, Western companies. So this was just a brief about the, the market trends, how it is different in East and West, and what is the potential growth and the direction for the companies in these areas. Now we'll be talking about how to become a super app or what are the basic steps or the main steps for you to become a super app. And as I, as I show in the example that we discussed earlier, that not all the apps, they started with the same business or they didn't follow the same format or the, the same steps exactly. However, there are three, four main milestones that almost most of the companies followed to be transformed into a super app. So the first step was mainly focusing on specific business area and building a very strong app and prove a very good presence with this strong app, regardless of what will be the business domain, whether it's food delivery, it's, the, it's uh, ride hailing, or it's fintech uh, app, but you need to build a very strong foundation that is scalable and to acquire a very good user base for, for your app. The second step and the most crucial step in the super apps actually is offering financial transactions or wallet to the customers. So a lot of um, articles and references are talking about the importance of having this financial aspect as part of your super app to ensure that your app actually uh, gives the user an end-to-end -end journey and covers all the aspects that they have. So whether the financial um, enablement will be uh, added uh, by integrating with third parties or sometimes in the case of Gojek, they acquired a fintech company. So there are different approaches how we're going to enable this financial transactions within your app. However, it's very important cornerstone and building block when it comes to transforming into a super app is giving the financial uh, ability or transactions as part of your services that you offer. Another important aspect is partnerships. Since as a super app, you are targeting to offer or give a, a variety of services and uh, different uh, services to your customers. So it's a very important aspect to open up your, your, your app or your structure to be able to introduce more partnerships and to expand your capabilities and the services that you offer to your customers through these different third party partnerships. And the last step or the last um, building block is actually loyalty. Uh, it's a very important aspect that you need to build a loyalty, uh, stickiness to your app, uh, making sure that the uh, services that you offer covers actually the lifestyle and the daily interaction the, the user will need, and this will create some loyalty. In addition, having access to the customer's data will help you to understand more data or more about the behavior of your customers and the need of your customers. Accordingly, you will start to build more stickiness and more um, uh, personalized experiences for your customers. So these are the main four steps that almost most of the super apps followed uh, in order to transform from a normal app to a super app. Okay, so uh, now we'll be talking about uh, the opportunities. What are the opportunities when it comes to transforming or building a super app? So when we tackle the opportunities, we'll tackle it from two perspectives. Um, first, we'll, we, will, we will have a look on the, on the market scene of when it comes to the trends and the usage of the customers to see if it makes sense actually to move to be a super app or not. So as per the charts that we can see now that there is an increase in the number of app downloads. And of course, this increase uh, or this trend has been increasing since COVID. And the people, they are starting to adapt more the online uh, solutions and started to use their mobile phones more frequently. 
So if you can see that there is almost 7% year over year growth when it comes to the app downloads. And this is aligned also with the number of apps that are available on the App Store and on the Google Store as well. And on average, people spend around 4.2 hours daily on their mobile device, which indicates the, the volume or the, um, how much people are currently attached to their mobiles and they're using their mobile phones uh, frequently. However, if we looked at the numbers, there is another um, statistics or insights that say that almost 50% of the time that we spend on our mobile devices is on one app only and around 77% is only on three apps. So we, we as human or the, the, the behavior that has been recognized that we are not very, um, we're not tending to switch between apps that frequently. However, we stick more to the apps that will make sense and will cover the needs that we have. So that's why the trend of uh, building super apps that actually tackles the need of the users and uh, create the stickiness behavior more makes more sense than just launching different services or different apps that focuses on only one service or only one aspect. So now we'll talk, we're bound to talk about why uh, do we think that uh, super apps will add value from the business point of view and from the user's point of view. So from the business for point of view, it creates a diversity in the revenue streams. So instead of focusing on a single business domain, uh, putting all your bets uh, towards one business domain, one persona, and one uh, use case or one value proposition, you will diversify your revenue stream through different services and through offering different uh, services your, to your customers. The second uh, um, value is actually the cost of acquisition. You don't have to spend a lot of time and a lot of money to acquire new customers to your new services. However, the customer that is already uh, familiar with your app and is using specific service will automatically be uh, adopting the other services or the other features that you, you are using. So we will be uh, saving a lot of effort and time and money in, when it comes to the cost of acquisition. Another thing is the, the point that we tackled before, which is the stickiness or the lifetime value of the customer. So since they will be using the app in different aspects, not only in one case or an occasion, a specific occasion, this will create more stickiness uh, to the app. And this will create more value to the customers and to the business as well. And this also will reflect in the enhancements of the cost of acquisition. So uh, the, the churn rate will be, will be less so because you are covering different aspects of the needs for the customers. And the last point is actually, it's a very important point and it's a key point. Since data is the most valuable asset that we have currently in, in modern ages. So uh, you will have actually access to the, to the data of the customers across all these services. You will be able to and have better understanding for the customer needs, use their data to customize their experiences, to, uh, to offer them tailored uh, experiences based on their needs and their behavior. So having access to all this data in an ecosystem, an integrated ecosystem will help you very much to introduce more value accordingly to create a higher lifetime value and to have uh, more acquisitions for the customers. So this is from the business point of view. From the user's point of view, uh, there are other benefits. Mainly it's the convenience and consolidation as referenced in the trends that we shared before that as human behavior, we tend to use less apps. So the idea of having one unified app will create more convenience and consolidation. Also the point related to the resources conservation. So um, it will help you maintain the battery, the, the storage that you have on your device, the internet usage, all this, all this will be maintained through using one app instead of using five or six apps. Another thing is the security. Uh, you will be trusting this super app and you will be using a single app instead of sharing your credential and your information and data across different apps and different uh, brands. So you will be mainly sharing your, your information with only one entity, which will make it more secure for you. Plus it will be easier when it comes to the, to the, sign, uh, to the sign in uh, as, as a daily activity. The last thing is the personalized experiences and offer. It's the same idea, but from the other perspective. 
because me as a user, I will see a tailored experiences for myself. I will see relevant offers that are related to the activities that I like to do or my behavior that has already been analyzed by the super app. So uh, the things and the experiences that I see and will be uh, exposed to me will be more relevant to my needs and to my behavior in general uh, as a user. So basically, these are the two aspects or the two um, areas where we see where we see why super apps make sense and create value value for the users and for the uh, um, companies as well. Okay, uh, so uh, now we'll be talking mainly about what are the main challenges. So in case you see that okay, this is the future and I want to transform into a super app. So we'll, we'll be tackling uh, the main challenges that you might face uh, when you are transforming to a super app. And we'll be recommending some best practices or ideas on how to overcome these challenges. Okay, so the first challenge that we'll be talking about now will be mainly the development of the app. So as I mentioned that we're expecting the super app to be super and to include a lot of features, a lot of services, and uh, this comes with a huge, uh, huge um, complexity on so many levels. So the first questions or the first areas that you need to tackle and to think very thoroughly is actually the development strategy, starting with how the solution or how the app will be structured and how the architecture will look like, how I'm going to maintain and develop this scale and this number of uh, features and services, how I will build a strong foundation that will help me later on to scale and to have technical foundation that I can build on, and basically what are the technologies that I need to use. The other challenge uh, that is also aligned with the steps of transforming into a super app is the partner integration. So as we mentioned earlier that partner integration is a crucial um, aspect or building block when it comes to transforming to a super app. So whenever you are building an, an app and you're planning for it to be a super app or whenever you are transforming into a super app, it's very important to think about how you're going to enable this integration for the partners to be able to build this ecosystem with the maximum um, collaboration between the partners that will help you grow your business. So th those are the two uh, challenges that we'll be talking about uh, now. So before jumping uh, to the solution, um, we're going to share with you two different approaches that are being adopted with the super apps in general. However, there is no definite right answer. It depends on the situation. It depends on your assessment of the how you want to grow or what is the best steps for you to be able to grow your app. So basically, when it comes to the architecture and the development strategy, there are two commonly used uh, approaches. Uh, we have two examples that are actually adopting the two approaches. The first one is WeChat and the other one is Revolut. Revolut actually, this is um, a British uh, fintech super app. And, uh, and it's also uh, has been introducing a lot of uh, fintech and financial offerings, and it's been growing uh, even outside the uh, UK recently. So talking about the different approaches. So for example, if we talked about WeChat, the concept of this approach or this architecture that basically will build a core app, a core hosting app, this core hosting app is built through native uh, native language, native, native development language. And this hosting app will enable integrating with uh, mini apps. Mini apps basically will be uh, smaller versions of the app representing different services. And these mini apps will be developed using uh, HTML or JavaScript technologies. And they will be added on top of the core app and will be launched as one big app. So this was this is the first approach for the WeChat. So as we can see that in the host, we will create the uh, the core app that will be hosting all the services and the modules, which are called the mini apps. For the services itself or the mini apps, these are totally independent apps that will be developed whether through external teams or standalone teams and will be embedded within the host app. The technologies that will be used will be a mix of both. The core app itself will be developed using native technologies and the mini apps will be added on top as HTML and JavaScript. For the deployment for, these, uh, for this model or this approach, 
basically you need all, only to deploy the host app or the core app on the on the um, on the store itself and any updates that you need to add in the mini apps later on will just uh, go seamlessly without the need of any updates through uh, the app because they're basically built through html and javascript uh, as of the partners uh, for WeChat, and this is also very well adopted um, uh, approach that actually they build like a guideline or tools that help partners to follow specific guidelines and uh, steps to, to create and test and develop and maintain their main apps and to integrate it by themselves through the core app. So that's only guidance and references that are given to the partners to enable them to integrate themselves through the mini apps. So this is the first approach. Um, actually, this is widely used, this approach that is being adopted or introduced by the WeChat. The other approach that is actually uh, used by Revolut is, uh, is a bit different. It's mainly like building a big app. So there is a base application. This base application is built also through native technologies. The services itself are represented as feature modules that are integrated directly in the base app using the same technology. So base, basically, it's part of the base app. And for the for the for the technologies, we'll be using only native technologies for both the base app and the feature or the modules itself. For the partners integration, it will be integrated through URLs that are embedded in the app. And this integration will happen actually by the base by the team who is owning the base application. And for the deployments, it will be mainly through the App Store whenever there is a change in the base application or there is a change in the feature module itself, the deployment or the update should go through the normal process of updating through the App Store. So these are the two different approaches. As I mentioned, there is no right and wrong. It depends on the structure and the scale of the of the of the business and how you want to structure your business both approaches are working however the second approach is normally or usually adopted by the fintech companies however the, uh, the other approach is widely used by other um, companies who started with mainly with different business domains not starting as a fintech super app. one last conclusion is regardless of the approach that you will be selecting there are two very important aspects that you need to consider when it comes to the development and the architecture. The first one is the modular architecture. Whether you're going to choose the first approach or the second approach, you should be very cautious when it comes to the architecture. You should have it as modular as possible, as independent as possible, uh, 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 to make sure that it is uh, there is no conflict and there is uh, easy integration. And I think also Farida will be tackling this part in more depth. The other part, the other important part is the open ecosystem. You need to build a system that is open enough to help your partners to integrate and to help you uh, open up your system and add more, add more functionality through uh, external integrations and partners without uh, effort or without the need of rebuilding everything. Okay, so by this, I think I tackled the, the, the first challenge and I think Farida will be covering uh, the rest of the challenges that we'll be talking about today. Thanks, Nuro. Thank you. Uh, so the next uh, theme or type of challenges that we're going to talk about today is the idea of big code, big teams, and big data. So um, the first challenge is the team structure. So um, how are you going to structure your team based on um, all those kinds of components? So as Nuron was talking, uh, was mentioning before, you would have a component for uh, payments, a component for uh, ride hailing, another component for ordering. So how can you structure your team given all those uh, different components so teams aren't bombarded with like too many features and so that um, it's, it, the communication and management is not, uh, is not a blocker. Um, so this is the first challenge. The second challenge is um, more related to prioritizing issues. So again, given the size of the super apps and given the different components, it's expected and it's normal actually to have a, a lot of uh, issues, let's say you have crashes or performance performance issues, how can you prioritize those crashes, which or those issues, which ones can, should you solve for first, which ones can wait. Um, and basically, it's, it's, it's a problem both on a team level and on a leadership level. So this is something that you really need to uh, have a strategy for. 
Um, the next uh, challenge in this team, that this team is the code conflict. So given, uh, again, the different components, how can you make sure that uh, there are no code conflicts? Uh, you don't have a lot of coupling between the different components. Um, this actually does not affect your development uh, efforts and development speed, uh, and does not affect your time to market, and does not affect the collaboration between the teams. Um, and finally, managing the debugging complexity. So how can you manage all the debugging information, all the data that you will be receiving on uh, your app, given that uh, all uh, those um, areas are kind of connected? Uh, so those are the challenges. And now we're going to talk about the different uh, best practices that you can do. So first, regarding the, the teams, you would need to create sub teams. You would need to create those teams around the different features or modules that you're using. So you have, you'll have a team focused on, given our previous example, a team focused on payments, another team focused on um, ordering, or you can even have a, a more granular breakdown depending on the size of your app and the size of your team. So this will highly uh, uh, make the communication easier. It will make your life basically a lot more easier. And this kind of uh, gets us to the concept of code ownership. So basically code ownership is around the idea of um, having clear responsibility on who owns what. So let's say you have an issue, you need to be very clear about who owns this issue and have your tools enable you to define and uh, um, define your uh, workflows according to those uh, code ownership definitions. So how can a team know which uh, a problem to focus on? Uh, this helps a lot in prioritizing again and on just driving a lot of focus and making sure that every team is focusing on their own KPIs and their performance metrics. Um, next is, as Nuram mentioned, is the modular architecture. So Basically, the benefit here is of modularization is it helps improve the, the overall developer experience. You wouldn't have as much uh, code conflicts. You wouldn't have a lot of blockers and things depending on each other. Um, uh, you would be able to develop code faster, ship it faster, and just have an overall better experience for your own developers, which directly translates into a better experience uh, for your users, which is what um, we're optimizing for. Uh, and um, finally, uh, given, again, the amounts of data that you would be receiving, given the components, the, the issues, and so on, you would need a way to view data in an aggregated format. Um, it would be nearly impossible to check every single issue that you have and all, its, all of its details. You would need something to tell you, OK, this is where the problem is. This is how the, all the problems combined together look like. And then you would, you would be able to um, uh, find patterns easier. And when you're, you, you were able to find patterns easier, it would definitely help you uh, uh, solve the issues easier. So this is um, uh, the best practices for handling the big code, big teams, and the amounts of big data that you would have on your uh, issues. Uh, the next theme is about application performance. And this is kind of a broad issue. It, it, has two main challenges. The first is app stability and performance. And when we talk about app stability and performance, mainly your performance issues, how stable is your app? Is it crashing? Does it have any um, performance problems? And this is actually very, very important for you to focus on because um, according to research, when an app is regularly crashing or regularly freezing or having uh, any kind of uh, performance issue, it was found that 53% of users actually just uninstall the app completely. 37% would stop using the app. They would never come back. And this is basically revenue uh, lost to your company. And 28% would look for replacements, basically going to competitors um, to fill the, the needs that you, that, that you were providing. And when it comes to expectations, uh, users actually do have very high expectations when it comes to performance. Um, the acceptable ranges to 49% of users is that the app should respond within two seconds or less. Anything above that is considered a frustrating experience and would lead to um, the consequences that um, I just mentioned. Um, another important factor and something that you need to keep an eye on is the app size. Um, because again, given all those, kind, all those components and the um, different things that you can do on your app, 
it's expected that you would um, have a bigger app size, but however, this is not something that you should just accept. You need to focus on this uh, issue because for every six megabyte increase in your app size, there is a 1% decrease in uh, conversion. So this is more less business actually getting into uh, your app. So focusing first on app stability and performance, the first thing that you need to focus on is and monitor proactively is the crash-free sessions. Basically, crash-free sessions is the number of sessions of user sessions that do not end with um, a crash. A crash is definitely the worst kind of um, experience that can happen to your users. So this is something that you avoid at all costs. You should definitely keep your crash fee session rate above 99 and even 99.8%. Uh, this is the, the recommended ranges. Um, and what can you do? What can you proactively do to uh, um, make sure this number uh, remains within acceptable limits? So the first thing that you need to do is early detection of, um, of crash spikes. So what a crash spike is, it's a sudden increase in your crash rate according to, based on some uh, issue on your app. And the way you can do this is by setting proactive uh, um, alerts that can detect this, these spikes before they actually reach a very high number of, uh, of users and result in bad reviews and uh, drops in uh, crash fee sessions. Uh, another thing that you need to do, given after the fact that you've ha actually had a crash, you need to be able to collect as much contextual insights as you can. Um, the, the ultimate goal here for you as a developer is to be able to reproduce the crash. And if you are able to reproduce the crash given all the, the information and data that you've uh, collected using the, the, the tools that you're using, uh, is to able to reproduce the crash and ship um, a solution for it. Uh, and finally, uh, you need to make sure that you're covering all the different kinds of crashes that you're not focused on uh, specific uh, specific kinds of crashes and ignoring the rest all crashes are equally bad to to customers so just make sure that you're covering all the the types of crashes this includes ndk crashes which is a c plus 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 crash happening on a an android application um anrs which is applications not responding if you're familiar with the concept it's when um, Android basically tells the user whether they want to terminate the app or not because the app is taking too long to respond. Um, another thing that you should monitor is out of memory crashes, which is an iOS crash. Uh, this is when the iOS kills your app because it's consuming uh, uh, way too much memory. So you need visibility on all kinds of crashes in order to be able to make sure that the, your crash free session stays in a healthy uh, range. The next thing that you need to monitor is waiting time. And what I mean by waiting time is uh, app launch time and network latency. So what is app launch time? This is the time it takes um, when you're starting the app uh, from, this, from the point you start the app until it becomes uh, uh, usable. So we can start the app from different uh, sources. You can start it like from scratch. You can start the app from a notification. So there are many ways that you can start an app and you need to make sure that all those uh, kinds of ways you're starting your app, um, that it's um, within acceptable ranges for your users. Uh, and network latency, it's basically the time needed for network calls to uh, take place. So what can you do to proactively uh, um, solve for those issues? Of course, you need to monitor those uh, metrics. And you need to do some things from your side to make sure that uh, you don't overcome, uh, you don't uh, go over those uh, thresholds. So first thing that you need to do is load essential elements first. So um, that's usually start with text and then images. Uh, you need to reduce the network calls that are blocking the app launch. So anything that is in the critical path of the app start, um, you need to reduce this because if you do a lot of uh, network calls in the app launch, it's definitely going to result in a bad uh, experience for your customers. If the app is not launching, there's a high chance that they don't even go into the app and they don't even get to see the value that your app is providing. So app launch is very important. Um, and as a rule of thumb, just load data when you need it. Don't load um, everything um, in advance. Load it when uh, there is a need for that. 
Uh, and finally, the, the third metric or the third kind of metrics that you need to monitor is uh, screen performance. Um, basically, uh, screen loading and UI responsiveness. So screen loading is basically the time, it the time a screen needs to load other than the first uh, app launch screen. This is normal screen loading between uh, during an, a user session. Um, and UI responsiveness is basically the time it needs for your app to respond to a user's uh, interaction. This user interaction can be a scroll, it can be a tap. Um, and the UI responsiveness is basically how much time the app is uh, taking to respond to those actions. Um, again, those are very important uh, metrics because they result in bad experiences. They might result in app terminations if you don't uh, monitor proactively monitor those uh, uh, metrics. So what can you do uh, to make sure that you're within the acceptable ranges for, uh, for your users? Um, as a rule of thumb, content loading, it shouldn't take more than one second. This is the considered an acceptable range. Total screen loading overall shouldn't take more than uh, one and a half seconds. And how can you do this? Um, there's a couple of things that you can do. Um, there's image handling. You can use image compression. Uh, you can use uh, caching of images. So we don't load images every single time that you need them. Um, also making sure that you re reuse uh, data templates. Um, it's the same idea of caching and reusing just to make sure that you don't load uh, unnecessary things uh, at unnecessary times and don't load them too much times that it's um, actually affecting your app performance. Okay. Uh, um, next is um, the app size. So again, you need to make sure that app size is not, because it's not, it's a super app, it doesn't mean it has to be a super sized app. Um, what you can do from your side to make sure this doesn't happen, you can remove any obsolete or unnecessary SDKs, only integrate lightweight SDKs, necessary SDKs that are well main maintained to make sure that they're not taking too much space and they're not causing any more uh, um, performance issues on your side. Another important concept that you need to, to consider, it's app thinning. Uh, basically, app thinning is reducing the size of, of the app. So um, this can be done in a couple of different ways. The first is using bitcode in iOS. So bitcode basically is some, transforms your code and maps it into a smaller size. And this is what is uploaded on the App Store. And the same concept uh, on Android is using ProGuard, which is also an open, it's, it's an open source uh, uh, tool that reduces the size and obfuscates your crashes uh, or obfuscates your app to make sure the size stays within um, the acceptable limits because users do not tolerate high uh, or big size apps. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about user experience. And um, this is a very interesting example. Actually, this is um, several screenshots from the Grab app. This is the same app. However, uh, as you can see, it has different layouts. Those different layouts are actually localized. Uh, so it's the same app in different countries. And based on the personas or the, the culture or the, the people using the app, they're customizing how it looks to make it more user-friendly and make it more aligned with um, the things that they're used to. So this is a very interesting uh, um, example. And if you are developing a super app, you should take care of just not having one um, uh, template that fits all. You can customize it based on who is going to use uh, the app. Other things related to user experience that you should uh, focus on, this is uh, the usability of, of your app, the discoverability of the different features. Super apps are mainly based on a lot of components. So in order for you as a business to get um, value and for your users to get the most value out of your app, they need to be able to discover all those different features. Uh, if some features are hidden or are not integrated well into the user experience, your users won't be able to reach them and neither the business or the users are going to benefit from this, uh, uh, from all those features. So you need to make sure that the app is usable and you need to make sure that it's uh, customizable or localized and that all the features are, um, are discoverable. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, back to you, Julie.
Thank you, Naran and Frida. Um, okay, we're going to go ahead and jump into the Q&A. Uh, again, if you have any questions, please go ahead and send those in. Uh, the first one is, can you expand on how to determine which type of architecture is best for your team? I'm sorry, Jody, can you repeat this? Can you expand on how to determine which type of architecture is best for your team? Yeah, actually, I think it depends on the maturity of the app and the, the scale that you want to, to start with. So as I mentioned that, for example, the, the first approach, which is uh, which was adopted by WeChat, basically it was depending on enabling the partners to integrate easily. So you are just building the base app and the space app is the core app that you, that you will have. And you will build a mechanism for all partners, external partners to build these many apps and, to, and integrate it. So basically the model is enabling third parties and external teams to integrate and to expand the partnerships. However, if you are focusing on building uh, an app in-house, and you're build, for example, if you're building a fintech app and you want to expand it to, uh, to cover different aspects and you are already having all, most of the teams in-house in the company. So in this case, it might be, it makes more sense in this case to adopt the other approach, which is building a modular, modularized uh, architecture and building one uh, super app or one app that adopts all the features in different modules. So again, there are many factors. It depends on the technologies that you want to use. If you're going to depend on the partners or you're going to build it all in-house on the business domain that you're going to start with. So you need to take all these aspects into consideration when you decide which architecture will make sense, more sense for you. Awesome. Thanks, Naran. Uh, the next question is, what tools does Instabug have that are specifically for super apps? Or that could be helpful to super apps. Yeah, that is the <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, this is actually the part that I was mainly talking about. Uh, Instabot gives you a lot of visibility on the different metrics, uh, whether that's crashes, app launch, network, um, custom traces. You can actually measure the performance of critical parts of your app to make sure that. So let's say, for example, the payments flow. That's extremely important. You need to make sure that its performance is. Um, on point, so we can measure um, with execution traces. Uh, and um, another important concept is code ownership. So Instabug um, focuses on this code ownership part. So we need to make sure that um, yeah, teams are able to know if a crash belongs to their team, and then those teams or those alerts or those things are routed to the right team. Uh, you can also customize alerts based on the, the critical uh, uh, screens. So again, again to the to the payment screen. This is actually, of course, the most important. If you want to have any special alerting experience for this kind of um, screen for spike detection, and um, uh, back to the, the the idea of having a lot of um, data. Uh, Instabug also offers a lot of aggregations on your uh, user data, so aggregations on where the crash has happened, the different app versions, different screens, users um, who faced those kinds of crashes. So it basically makes the um, debugging experience a lot easier given the size of, um, of super apps. Great. Thanks, Frida. Um, next question is, do you see super apps displacing other apps in similar spaces? For example, Facebook taking market share from uh, apps like DoorDash. Yeah, I think this might happen because um, as we can see that this is a trend that is upcoming in the West. So it's uh, even with the big names like Facebook and other companies, I think this will be the next generation or the next steps for these companies to take over and to take a good place in the super app space. Yeah, and given what Nuron was mentioning at the beginning of the webinar, it seems like people have a tendency to not um, go scrolling through different apps. You, you're spending most of your time on, on like three apps. So if there's one app that is covering a lot of the things that you need to do, I think there's a very high chance that you would stay on uh, this app versus going through different uh, different ones. Okay. Um, and the final question we have is, what is the greatest drawback for a company to expand into a, so, uh, into a super app? Um, 
I th yeah, <laughs> I think besides the challenges, uh, so it's, it will be really tricky and I think it will be a tough journey to, to follow the steps, the right steps. So, for example, one of the main things or traps that they can fall in is simply the user experience, as Farida mentioned. So bombarding the application with so many features that they are not usable and not discoverable by the, the end users, they end up by losing, not gaining more customers. So I think it, it will be tricky when it comes to managing the scale, managing the expectations of the customers, when exactly to launch new services and how they're going to integrate these services with the existing, existing ecosystem that they have. So overcoming all these challenges, uh, making sure that they understand their customer base properly, designing the experiences for them properly, they're taking care of the architecture and the structure of the app and the expectation that we talked about when it comes to the stability and the app size and all these aspects. So I think having all these together, if they fall in any of these, uh, this case, it will be risky and it will not end up um, with a success story like the other uh, super apps. Yeah, basically handling all the chaos that comes with the, with yes, the super exactly. apps. That's the, the biggest uh, challenge. Great. Well, that was the last question that we have. Um, I just wanted to thank Frida and Iran for going through this presentation. And thank you to everyone um, who attended. And as a reminder, the, this recording will be sent out to your email in the upcoming days. And thank you. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye. Bye.